sexy people, this is Jackie from the Sexy Politico. Thank you for understanding as I took a two week break from recording this podcast. I'm refreshed and ready to bring you this week's podcast. If you like what we do, please like and subscribe, leave a comment, tell us on our social media how you feel about us and leave us some love. If you really love us, you can check out our Patreon or check out our support link here on Anchor. Today we're going to begin part four on women in the armed forces and we're going to be talking about the Air Force. Now the Air Force is the newest or the big four branches of service and has had a longer history of allowing women to join its ranks in, in relation to how long it's existed. So the Air Force was separated into its own branch of service in 1947. Before this we had the Army Air Force. In 1947, members of the Women's Army Corps, or the WAC, were technically still in the Army, but they were performing Air Force duties. And in 1948, these women could transfer into the Women in Air Force, WAF, as we're going to call them from now on, if they wish to. This was around the same time as the Women's Armed Services Integration Act, And as we've talked about in the previous three podcasts about women in the military, this gave women permanent status in the military. Before this, women could only serve in the military during wartime. Now, Esther McGowan Blake was the first woman to join the the WAF, or the Air Force. And she joined the WAF in the first minute of the first hour of the first day that the regular Air Force duty was authorized for women in July 8, 1948. Now, let's talk about women who are already pilots. And these women would have seemingly been good candidates for WAF leadership, but they were diverted into the Air Force Reserves. So, for example, let's take Nancy Hartness Love, and she was the founder and commander of the Women's Auxiliary Ferry and Squadron, or the WAFs, and the executive of the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, or the WASPs. She was awarded the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in the Reserves in 48 after it was directed to admit women. Jacqueline Cochran, who had volunteered in the Royal Air Force and had demonstrated some solid leadership by expanding the WASP program, was directed to join the Reserves in 48, in which she rose to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in 1969. The female pilots in the reserves, though, were not classified as military personnel. They were classified as federal civilian employees, and that distinction is very important. The Air Force has only existed since 47 so the korean war is the first war that the air force even existed in and during the korean war only medical air evacuation nurses actually served in combat zones other women were in japan and elsewhere serving as air traffic controllers weather operators radar operators and photo interpreters during vietnam less than a thousand women served in southeast asia As in Korea, these women served as evacuation nurses and medical evacuation personnel. Elsewhere, WAF members served in support staff assignments in hospitals with MASH units in other service clubs, in headquarter offices, and in intelligence, and as just a variety of personnel positions. But once we get into the 60s, the legal ceiling for promotions were lifted. And so in 1971, G.N.M. Holm became the first female airman to be promoted to Brigadier General. In 1976, the WAF was dissolved and women joined the ranks of regular Air Force service members. And that same year, the Air Force Academy first admitted women. We don't really hear a lot about different changes in the Air Force until 1993, when combat exclusions were lifted from aviation positions, and this allowed women to serve in almost 
any aviation capacity. So in 94, the Pentagon sort of, um, they made it more specific and they stated service members are eligible to be assigned to all positions for which they are qualified, except that women shall be excluded from assignments to units below the brigadier level whose primary mission is to engage in direct combat on the ground. That means, so for the Air Force, that's, that means that most positions opened up to everybody because there aren't actually a lot of jobs in the Air Force that deal with direct combat. I mean, fighter pilots, sure, but we, we think of the Air Force as a bunch of fighter pilots just zooming off like Top Gun, but in reality, most of the Air Force is dealt with intelligence, you're, you're fixing planes, your crew, you're not, you, you're not shooting, shooting people down with airplanes in most, most cases. In 1993, Sheila Wendell became the first female secretary of the Air Force, and that made her the first woman to lead a U.S. military branch in the Department of Defense. Now we move up again into 2012. Janet Wolf Barnger became the Air Force's first female four-star general. In 2013, Defense Secretary Leon Panetta removed the military's ban on women serving in combat. The branches of service had until May of 2013 to drop plans for opening all units to women and until 2015 to actually implement this. At the end of 2015, Defense Secretary Ash Carter stated that in 2016, all combat jobs would open to women, and that in March of 2016, he approved the final plans of military services to, and special operations to open up all combat jobs and authorize the military to begin integrating females into co as combat soldiers right away. In June of 2020, Emily Thompson became the first female fighter pilot to fly an F-35A stealth plane from Al Dafar Air Force Base in the United Arab Emirates to an undisclosed Middle East location. So this is a shorter podcast than we had for the other branches of service just because the Air Force hasn't been around as long. But as we look into women's short history in the Air Force, it seems as though these women have had fewer hoops to go through, mostly because there hasn't been as much time to create these hoops. Most of these jobs would have been open to women since the 90s, and the Air Force has had this perception of being more female friendly. Every branch of service has a section on its Wikipedia page about different bad deeds that have happened, and most of it within the military has to do with sexual assault. Now, sexual assault isn't pervasive in any particular branch of service because it's pervasive in the military as a whole, and that is something that the military is, is dealing with and something that we shouldn't, we should not take the gas off of making the military deal with is the issue of sexual assault in the military. The future though is quite bright for the Air Force. So Space Force was created in 2019. It's not just a TV show. Space Force was created within the Department of the Air Force. And what this is doing is just creating these brand new opportunities. Space Force isn't NASA. Space Force is its own thing. But I'm sure that most of Space Force is also working with NASA. And who knows what's going to come out of that other than cool new uniforms and a TV show that's making fun of it. But this is... The, this is it, though, for this week's episode of the Sex Politico podcast. Thank you for subscribing. Let me know what you would like to hear from us, and we will continue to bring great content. You can find us at thesexypolitico.com, and also you can look for or search The Sexy Politico on any social media, and you should be able to find us. So I hope you're doing well. Stay safe. Stay sexy. Bye.